I'm standing at the entrance to the Park Cave in the Ilm Park. There's a system of tunnels running underground down to the river that originally stretched for half a kilometre. It was built for Duke Karl August at the turn of the 18th century to drain used water away from a planned brewery. But the brewery was never built and the tunnels fell into disrepair for many years. Today it's been partially restored and there's an underground museum examining both human and geological history. However, the light is not good enough for my simple camera, so I'll stick to observing it from the surface. I began this episode by playing a short section from my piece for brass band called Reality Cavern. The title makes reference to a novel written by myself that pertains to a kind of reality TV game set in a cave system not unlike this one. But I'm using it here as an introduction to a further consideration of metaphysics. I want to look at the work of Friedrich Schelling, who, like Hardenberg, attempted to integrate idealism with realism to create a synthesis, an absolute idealism. Schelling's writing is difficult to summarise because it encompasses several contrasting stages. His best-known work on integrating idealism and nature was predated by a strong interest in the subjective idealism of Fichte, and it was followed by a detailed investigation of absolute identity in the context of mystical freedom and mythology. But I'll focus on the Natur philosophy of the turn of the 19th century, which rejected Fichte's solipsism and developed a premise that the world exists simultaneously as both independent of the mind and as an expression of the mind. Schelling's work of this period was to have a big impact upon other thinkers of his time. He was first introduced to Goethe at a social gathering in Schiller's house in Jena, and immediately the statesman was impressed by the younger man's expertise on light and optics. He was also drawn by Schelling's account of teleology as an intrinsic force governing not only the mind, as Cantor proposed, but also nature. Goethe had grown disillusioned with the complete rejection of empirical science implied by the transcendental idealism of both Kant and Fichte, and he recognised the potential in the younger man's work to address these fundamental issues. Robert Richards wrote, First, and most importantly, Schelling's philosophical view, especially as developed in his System de Transcendentalem Idealismus, theoretically demonstrated that scientific understanding and artistic intuition did not play out in opposition to one another, as Goethe once thought, but that they reflected complementary modes of penetrating to nature's underlying laws. Goethe appointed Schelling as a professor at the University of Vienna in 1798, when just 23 years old. The two men remained close for the next few years, both in terms of their friendship and their continuing dialogue and shared opinions concerning the fundamentals of science, until scandal drove yet another figure away. But I'll get to this later. As I've said, Schelling had been heavily influenced by Fichte in his early years, before his time in Jena, but the interest was short-lived. It was his interest in the Venotian monism and the associated rejection of the two-substance metaphysics of Descartes that convinced him subjective introspection must be balanced by an objective investigation of nature. Eventually, Schelling rejected the notion popular among idealists that all natural phenomena are reducible to the mind. He didn't consider it paramount that he reject all of Kantian epistemics, and in particular the idea that there are necessary connections between cognitive structures and perception of the natural world, but he believed the constraints are not so great as to prevent an appreciation of how the realms of the mental and physical are reconciled by an absolute condition of existence. He argued that the subjective selfhood addressed by Fichte and the infinite substance of Spinozism are identical. Comparing Schelling's work with that of Fichte, Hegel wrote, In Fichte's system, identity constitutes itself only as subjective subject-object. But this subjective subject-object needs an objective subject-object to complete it, so that the absolute presents itself in each of the two subject-objects and finds itself perfected only in both together as a highest synthesis that nullifies both insofar as they are opposed. Schelling published his System of Transcendental Idealism in 1800 and explained how a fusion of transcendental and nature theory embodied three main ideas. Firstly, that nature develops organically from whole to parts, 
whereby the development of the lower taxonomic tiers of life supervenes upon higher levels and in turn upon the totality of life. Schelling argued that biological species should be seen as an archetypal ideal of themselves. Secondly, Schelling argued that although nature is purposefully organised, it's not a static mechanistic system. It involves processes of dynamic change. It's distinguished by a self-development that itself generates progressively more complex life. That's to say, plants and animals and all living things progress or even evolve from one generation to the next. Thirdly, this process of organic development is teleological. Evolutionary development is oriented upon realizing the archetypal ideals. In other words, biological organisms change over time according to the natural forces governing the whole of nature. If birds develop longer and stronger wings, it's because the laws of nature are guiding their archetypal anatomy in this direction. Schelling argued further that teleology is an ascetic concept. He said it's not something that can be identified objectively, either in the mental or natural worlds. Nevertheless, the faculty of ascetical perception enables the subject to identify natural forces as analogous to the dynamic forces underpinning the human expression of arts, and furthermore, to appreciate how beauty is analogous with the innate spirit of nature. Indeed, Schelling approached the entire history of human civilization as an equivalent to the development of nature, both of them as dramas possessing teleological or purposeful orientation. He argued that, given the mind of both the individual and that of the community strives for resolution through art, the history of human development and progress is led by way of aesthetic consciousness, which finds its fulfillment in great art by way of its intrinsic teleology. The artist by attaining the capacity of genius, motivated by a primal creativity analogous to the universal creativity of the absolute, fuses all forces of opposition, including all mirror concepts, into the image of absolute harmony. Accordingly, the infinite, expressed in finite terms, is art and poetry, music and literature, all of them artificial products designed of human genius that reveal the absolute of both mind and nature. Robert Richards wrote, Art, for Schelling, thus became the model for nature. And so he could introduce the romantic concept that nature is a poem that lies enclosed in a secret, wonderful script. This was a philosophical position that could only attract Goethe's admiration. Schelling's work received a lot of attention among the philosophical and scientific communities in Saxe Weimar, but in the end, his notoriety rested upon something entirely different. There was something else he shared with Novalis besides his interest in absolute idealism, love and infatuation, and ultimately heartache. Schelling had become deeply involved with Caroline Schlegel and her young daughter Augusta. Caroline was a central figure among the Jena romantics, a person of considerable dynamism and intelligence, while Augusta was a charming pre-adolescent, and he fell in love with them both. Caroline had been a part of the extended Weimar community for many years. She'd known Goethe even before Augusta was born. Indeed, she was one of only a few people who'd been given an early copy of his Ephigenia. There had been rumours that he was the father of Augusta, after she was born exactly nine months after a period of particularly close association, although his paternity was never substantiated. The girl's father remained a mystery to her dying day. Caroline had married Wilhelm Schlegel, a man of considerable reputation, in 1798, and moved into his house in Jena with her daughter, who by now had turned 13 years old. Caroline helped her new husband with the translation of several Shakespeare plays, but as the months passed by, became increasingly attached to Schelling. Schlegel tolerated the young man as a frequent visitor to the family house, even when the deep affection with which he held mother and daughter became apparent to all, and there was a rumour of scandal in the air. There had been informal talk that Schelling might take Augusta to wedlock at some time in the future, but just as was the case with Novalis' Sophie, circumstances turned to tragedy. Caroline became sick with typhus and travelled south to a small village in Franconia to recuperate. Her relationship with Schlegel had soured, but she was joined by Schelling and Augusta a few weeks later. In time, Caroline recovered, but Augusta suddenly fell ill with dysentery. 
Schelling had received some medical training and tried to help, but tragically, the girl died two months after her 15th birthday. Both Caroline and Schelling were devastated by Augusta's untimely death, and they drew even closer. Back in Jena, Schelling was blamed by many for the death of the girl, having been ineffective in providing suitable medical care, and this, coupled with the immensity of the tragedy, caused the couple to withdraw from society. Schelling spent some time at Goethe's house, receiving consoling and reassuring words from his long-term benefactor. There was a difficult divorce to sort out, but Goethe agreed to help, and Caroline Schlegel and Friedrich Schelling were married in 1803, and thereafter obliged to move permanently back to the south, away from Weimar. Despite his departure from Weimar society, Schelling's ideas remained topical. They were not only of interest to Goethe. Among others, they also inspired Alexander von Humboldt, the Prussian explorer and naturalist whose explorations around the globe were as wide-ranging as those of Charles Darwin several decades later. Humboldt had already been drawn into the Weimar circle of intellectuals by way of his friendship with Goethe, but it was Schelling's vision of nature as a holistic entity whereby all parts could be seen to interact with one another that enabled him to explain his findings. Thereafter, in the ensuing decades, there was a tendency among subsequent generations of scientists to ridicule Schelling and those of his era for an apparent tendency to place experimental findings in a speculative fog of unsubstantiated hypothesising. Nevertheless, Jena scientists such as Ernst Haeckel still sustain certain elements of idealism in their theoretical conceptions of science. I'll visit the Haeckel Museum in a later episode. And with hindsight, it's possible to discern that Schelling's speculative metaphysics was not intended as a substitute for empirical science at all. He was as thorough as anyone of his time in paying due regard to experimental procedure. His speculations about an absolute idealism and his suggestion that the fundamental laws of physics derived their universality and necessity from transcendental categories of mind were a substantive attempt to explain empirical findings by way of theory. In a previous episode, I compared Fichte's subjective idealism and his account of existence as entirely mind-dependent with modern radical anti-realism. Following on from that, I'd like to use this brief account of Schelling's absolute idealism and his fusion of the objective and subjective, the real and the anti-real, into a single entity to look at the objections made by metaphysical realists to the anti-realist position. I should start by summarising the anti-realist position once more which on first impression seems to represent a refutation of the common sense understanding of the world. The common sense position argues that trees and microbes and all of nature would not cease to exist if humans disappeared from the planet and are therefore not dependent upon the human mind. The anti-realist retorts that if the individual accepts a theory which allows for the existence of trees and microbes in the entire natural world, this theory also allows for trees and the rest continuing to exist in the case whereby humans disappear from the planet. In other words, the anti-realist position, while positing a mind-dependent ontology, does not imply that nature is causally dependent on the existence of humans. In the tradition of Fichte and Herder, anti-realism posits that any particular notion of existence depends upon a particular conceptual scheme, and that it's not possible to determine an objective view of the physical properties contained in the world that is independent of that conceptual scheme. The objects which are seen to exist are the objects that the particular conceptual scheme says exists. The proposition electrons exist is to be taken as electrons exist relative to the theoretical premises of contemporary science. This approach implies that given the limitless possibilities of conceptual schemes, that there cannot be a universal description of totality able to claim an ontological commitment to the existence of electrons or anything. Anti-realists assert that the subject creates descriptions of nature and natural law not as a response to an objectively detectable state of affairs, a metaphysical reality, but to socially established conditions for affirming these descriptions. One of the clearest explanations that I've come across of this representation problem is Hilary Putnam's model theoretic argument. Putnam points out that a sentence as simple as the music is finished can have multiple meanings. 
It can refer to a particular piece of music having ended, or it can refer to the demise of an entire genre. It could even be a reference spoken ironically to something completely different, such as the wind is no longer blowing in the trees. As a speech act, it can be conditional or counterfactual. It can mean anything. Putnam said all sentences share the same attributes. He argued that the link between mental representations and mind-independent objects, of how thoughts and words are linked with mind-independent states of affairs, is a function of a private realm that is indefinable by definition. There are a limitless number of ways in which mental symbols can be correlated with objects in the world, and it's not possible to determine a single correct version of reciprocity. And if empiricism is governed by the principle of falsification, then even an ideal theory of meaning, whereby words and definitions are determined to correlate precisely with objects and properties in the world, might still be false, or one of many. In summary, if a common sense approach says that realism is empirically demonstrable, then anti-realism says an empirical justification of realism is impossible by definition. But realists are not impressed by this argument. I'm sure that Friedrich Schelling wouldn't have been satisfied either. He would have wanted to fuse realism and anti-realism, the objective and the subjective, the universal and the relative, into a single absolute entity. And I think both he and Goethe will be delighted to find that modern metaphysical realism has found ways to refute the arguments of a hard anti-realist position. Realism acknowledges that the semantics of knowledge are subject to problems related to the correlations between mind and nature. However, it retorts that this doesn't imply in itself the existence of a mind-independent reality as illusion. Quite the opposite. It's the conceptual schemes that are the illusion. It's the epistemic states underpinning these schemes that are the problem, not the actual existence of a mind-independent world. If the anti-realist says the human mind exists absolutely and the world beyond is determined by that mind, then the realist retorts that it's a world that exists absolutely and the human mind that has difficulty observing it and understanding it. Furthermore, the realist argues that advances in science are not simply shifts from one mental scheme to another, as the anti-realist position implies, but are oriented upon eventually reducing epistemic restrictions to knowledge of the mind-independent world. Anti-realist metaphysics will go the way of flat earth and geocentric theories. Already, cognitive psychology is exploring how conceptual thought and linguistic interpretation may be reduced to evolutionary biology. So, looking at things objectively, mental schemes, according to the realist, are reducible to biology, which, according to the anti-realist, are defined by mental states, which, according to the realist, are reducible to biology, which, according to the anti-realist, are defined by mental states. Anti-realism fails to undermine realism, and realism fails to undermine anti-realism. These things are irreconcilable because the two approaches are governed by completely different metaphysical assumptions that cannot be reconciled. However, Putnam argued that this irreconcilability is itself based upon false assumptions. He said the real concern should be with the autonomy of mental life from its natural context. He posited another theory, this time of functional isomorphism, whereby mind can be seen to have different unique ancestries, yet sustain the same form and function. Here's an example. If my hip joint gets old and I need surgery to replace the bone material with a new artificial prosthetic, then hopefully, after the operation, I should be able to stand tall and declare that the function of my hip, enabling my mobility, is not necessarily to be associated with the actual physical substance, the bone. Similarly, the pumping process and function of the heart does not necessarily require organic material. Putnam picks up on this idea that two systems can be made of different physical substances and yet still create the same functional result. The point being, that if the mind is considered to be a function of the brain, then theoretically we could replace the physical substance of the brain with something artificial and still get consciousness. It doesn't matter what the substance is generating the function. Putnam asked his readers to imagine two parallel worlds where one universe has people made of soul substance and another has people with material substance brains and where both peoples think and perceive things in exactly the same way. They're materially different, but their minds are the same. 
In other words, it doesn't matter if mental states are reducible to biology or if biology is defined by mental states. I'll look at these issues again later in this inquiry, but before that, a return to art. Robert Richards wrote, Schelling had argued that the laws of nature, which the poet-scientist might comprehend, would be also laws of free creativity. All of which brings me back to the unique kind of reality TV described in my novel, Reality Cavern, which in turn includes a character who's a composer writing a piece of music for brass band called Reality Cavern, and yet clueless to the broad context of the surroundings. I won't reveal any more of the plots now, but here's another sample of the music. Music 